Over the years I've been doing these videos, I've looked at the weird, wacky, and what the hell were you smoking if you thought that was a good idea stories from our favourite sport. Well, second in my case, because football exists. Or third, because snooker exists. But the point remains, there is stuff that's happened through the history of Formula 1 that makes you go, okay, that's cool, but there's also the stuff that makes you go, what? There's the double and blown diffusers that I've done before. There's McLaren's second brake pedal from the 1997 and early part of 1998 season that cost them just 50 quid, with Ferrari overthinking and over-engineering their own version so it was easier to get it banned. Dual access steering from a couple of years ago. That's the cool stuff, the stuff that makes us go, that's brilliant, and it's what makes us love Formula 1. Then there's the fever dream stuff. Six-wheel Tyrrells, the so-called X-Wings banned in early 1998, the split rear wing thing that Ferrari tried, those mini front wings that Honda tried in 2008, the Mercedes W196 that was basically a Le Mans sports car, and the whole using a helicopter engine to power your Indy 500 entry that Lotus tried in the 1960s. But one thing that turned up in recent memory, and by recent we're talking 19 years ago, is the Williams FW26. Williams had suffered a tiny bit of a slump in the latter part of the 1990s. After winning the drivers and instructors double with Jacques Villeneuve in a thrilling and controversial European Grand Prix, Williams were left in a little bit of a pickle following that season, which to date is the last time they experienced drivers and or constructors glory. Which is a sad thing to see and I'm not just saying that as a Williams fan even though I am wearing orange, bought this from the F1 store, affiliate link in the description if you want to use it, but the whole thing is sad as well because Williams won the Constructors title in 92, 93, 94, 96 and 97. There were only three other teams to win a Constructors title in that decade, McLaren, Benetton and Ferrari. For 1998 Williams two main weapons had left. Adrian Newey, who had gone to McLaren, where his car with Mika Hakkinen behind the wheel would win the championship, and Renault had pulled factory support at the end of 1997, meaning both Williams and Benetton would have to use rebadged 1997 engines through 98 and 99, leaving them underpowered compared to the rest of the grid. Williams would still finish third in the 1998 season, albeit a massive way off Ferrari and McLaren. I mean, look at those scores. McLaren 156, Ferrari 133, Williams with 38. I mean, at least it was close between Williams, Jordan and Benetton, with Jordan clinching fourth at the final race at Suzuka, thanks to Damon's dive bomb on the final lap into the chicane. 1999, though, was tougher. Williams slipped to fifth behind Jordan and Stewart, and Jordan and Stewart would win races that season while Williams would not. And Ralph Schumacher would score every single point for Williams in 1999, as Alex Zanardi, who had joined the team fresh from IndyCar, or CART, depending on what you want to call it, well, it was actually CART, but IndyCar is the catch-all term, well... He didn't score a single point that season. But for 2000, things were starting to look up. BMW sponsorship on board and Williams in general sported a whole new look and identity. While having been partnered with cigarette brands for the last however long, the Williams team arrived on the grid in the new millennium with a cleaner look. They had more tech companies on the car and the cigarette sponsorship was replaced with stop smoking aids instead. There was the driver market stuff going on as well. Williams in 1999 had Juan Pablo Montoya as its test driver, and Frank did a deal with Chip Ganassi so that Frank would get Zanardi and Ganassi would get Montoya. Following Zanardi's poor 1999, Williams would terminate Zanardi's contract a year early, and Jensen Button would drive for Williams in 2000, before Montoya finally joined the team in 2001. Part of the switch to a cleaner image was also due to the fact that Rothmans, that had been sponsoring the team since 1994 with that iconic blue and white livery and later red livery in 98 and 99, had been bought out by British American Tobacco. Now, British American Tobacco already had its own team, British American Racing, and there was no way that they were going to promote one of their brands on a rival team's car. 2000 was encouraging for the team, and when Montoya came in for 2001, results picked up. Schumacher winning three, Ralph Schumacher that is, and Montoya won that being the race at Monza where he no doubt used his kart experience with the lower downforce cars. 2002 was a little less successful, in part to the Ferrari dominance of that year, with Williams winning just the one race in Malaysia. But 2003 was a case of so close yet so far. Many thought that Montoya had a genuine chance of the title that year, who would win four races at Monaco and Germany under Montoya, and then Schumacher at Manicor and the Nürburgring. But that season was undone for two reasons. The first being the rather convenient, well at least Ron Dennis, Patrick Head and Flavio Brutori thought it was convenient, banning of that particular construction of Michelin tyres. Tyres that had been legal and signed off by the FIA since the 2002 San Marino Grand Prix. Now Ferrari was complaining that they were illegal, and the FIA agreed, so Michelin had to change the construction of the tyres. A construction of tyre that these cars were not built around. 
that sun's starting to annoy me. The second was a penalty issued to Montoya at the US Grand Prix at Indianapolis, where Montoya, who had his car quite a distance alongside Barrichello, had the Ferrari turn across him, whereupon it was spat off into the gravel on the outside of Turn 2. Montoya was given a penalty for it, which many thought was convenient as it ended Montoya's championship hopes. It's often listed as being one of the instances of Ferrari international assistance in those Ferrari dominance years. But what is a fun fact about that 2003 season is Schumacher won it by just two points from Raikkonen, who had only won one race all season. Schumacher won six races and a total of eight drivers would win a race that season, including the Jordan of Giancarlo Fisichella at the Carnage Field Brazilian Grand Prix. So the year ticks over into 2004 and Williams turns up for the first race in Australia with a car that attracts a lot of attention from the drivers, the teams, the media and everybody watching the race at the track and watching at home on TV. And that's because the new FW26 had, um, well it had a nose job. The car sported a bizarre front wing design. The term often used to describe it is like a pair of walrus tusks, and the walrus nose Williams is a description that makes most F1 fans know exactly what you're talking about. You don't even have to know the chassis number. Walrus nose Williams. Oh yeah, Patrick Head's 2004 fever dream. Head, Gavin Fisher and Antonia Terzi had taken the quite successful FW25 from 2003 and updated it for 2004 to extract more performance, which is the norm for this sort of thing. But at the front end, the aerodynamics team, led by Terzi, who had recently come over from Ferrari, had tried something radical with the front end. They'd outfitted the car with a shorter, stubbier nose, and these two crescent-shaped front wing supports, or walrus tusk-shaped supports if you want to keep up with the whole naming of things, which in turn left a massive gaping hole in the middle designed to funnel more air under the car and produce more downforce. The way Formula 1 cars were designed at that time is that the front wing was low to maximise the airflow over it, with cars now sporting noses that were sort of in between the higher nose cones of the late 90s and the low nose cones of the early 90s. They kind of drooped off towards the end as opposed to just sticking straight forward. I hope the images on your screen help illustrate that better than I can explain it because I'm not an aerodynamic. Since there was less nosage going on in that big hole in the middle, it meant that there was less drag in that central portion of the car, which meant that more air could then go under the car towards the keel. Now a keel is this piece of bodywork underneath the car. With the older low nose designs of the early 90s, such as the FW14B, FW15C and so on, it was easier to just bolt the suspension assembly to that particular part of the car. With the advent of higher nose designs throughout the 1990s, starting with Harvey Postlethwaite's Tyrrell 019 to the Benetton B192 into what was seen into the early 2000s, F1 teams started adding keels to the underpart of the car to allow the suspension to have somewhere to be bolted to. It means that the lower suspension arms have somewhere to go. The downside is that these things are interfering with the air passing under the car. With a super high nose design, these things are problematic, and single keels were out of favour around the early 2010s when F1 cars had those older 90s style high noses. In 2000, Harvey Postlethwaite, who was now at Honda, came up with a twin keel design that fit more with the way that the noses were being developed, meaning that you had two smaller anchor points for the suspension, which was first used by Sauber in a racing capacity in 2000, and later copied by everybody else to make their lives easier. So Williams was using one of these twin keel designs on the FW26, which meant that the air was less restricted going underneath the car and greater improved the aerodynamic efficiency. The car performed well in testing with Williams designing the whole thing to be a championship contender from the outset, while at the same time refusing to label the walrus nose a radical design. It is devalued because it's overused, said Fisher, and to a large extent the possibility is excluded by the restrictive technical regulations that govern Formula 1. That said, it will be immediately evident to onlookers that a high degree of innovative design has gone into the FW26. On top of this, fully automatic gearboxes which were used by most teams with manual downshifts had been banned, as had launch control. Traction control was still available and in testing Montoya found the car to not be that much different to what he'd been using the previous year. Now powering the car was BMW's all new P84, which was a significant update on the previous P83. BMW managed to get their new V10, now designed to last 500 miles or so, to chuck out around 950 horsepower at about 19,000 RPM. And it sounded a little like this.
Unfortunately though, when it came to racing this thing, Williams was put on the back foot a little bit. The problem was the car had a very narrow setup window and it was being absolutely decimated by the Ferrari F 2004, but then again, who wasn't? On top of this, Renault and BAR were genuinely outpacing the Williams cars, and because the front wing had to be reinforced to pass the FIA's crash tests, it was heavier than it should be, and it kind of upset the balance of the car at the same time. In the early season, Montoya would get a second place in Malaysia and a third place at Imola, the Imola race being the you either have to be blind or stupid not to see me race, while Ralph's best result was fourth in Australia. The mid-season though was more barren than the surface of Mars, with Montoya 8th at the Nürburgring and then two disqualifications in a row at Canada and Indianapolis. The Canadian Grand Prix disqualification for both JP and Ralph was for having illegal brakes, while Montoya was disqualified at Indy for changing cars after the formation lap had started. Also at the US Grand Prix, Schumacher had been involved in an accident where he damaged his back and would miss the next six races while he recovered. His seat would be occupied by Marc Genet for the French and British Grand Prix, and then Antonio Pizzoni from Hockenheim to Monza. So for the Hungarian Grand Prix, Williams had to cut their losses and change the front end to be pretty much what the rest of the field was using, and the results were revelatory as it became the fastest F1 car ever built. Montoya going round the Monza circuit in qualifying with an average speed of around 163 miles an hour, which lasted until 2020 when Lewis Hamilton went round with an average speed of 164 miles an hour. The new front nose assembly used the same droop snoot design as everybody else, but used a slightly narrower and pointier end, a bit like McLaren was using on their failed MP419 project, although McLaren's nose drooped much further than everybody else's and resembled more of the 2005 nose designs. Ferrari though had long since wrapped up the championship, and the FW26 would score its only win of the season at the season finale in Brazil, which was also Montoya's last race for Williams before departing for McLaren. Schumacher also put in strong drives in China and Japan despite retiring from the Chinese Grand Prix and it meant that Williams had a strong end to a 2004 season, a season where they would finish fourth behind Ferrari, BAR and Renault. To make matters worse, Frank was in disputes with BMW. Both the drivers were off to Pastures New with Montoya off to McLaren and Schumacher off to Toyota. And at the same time, there was a big technical shakeup in the background because this was the last car that Patrick Head would be properly hands on with. But that's all something to look at in the future because a lot of people think that the FW26 was the start of Williams' downfall. So I might look at that in the future along with the next time that somebody would try to do a walrus tusk design, that Lotus from 2014. So then a look at the radical but not radical Williams FW26. If this has brought back memories or taught you something new then do like the video so I know I've done a good job and for more stuff like this get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks to the patrons and also to the channel members that support the channel at a more personal level. And if you want to help support me at a more personal level, a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord and socials, or there's the join button under the video, along with super thanks if you just want to do a one and done donation. And like I said, there's also the link there to the F1 store affiliate link that you can click and buy stuff and I get a little bit of a kickback. So until next time, I've been Aidan Moore. Have a cracking day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.